As the slide indicates, I'm Colin Riley. I'm with uh, New York City's Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. It's a mouthful, so we call it Do It. Um, and uh, as I like to do, I just sort of give you an overview of who, the what, the where, the why, um, status on the effort, and uh, my final thoughts. Um, and uh, with that, I'll proceed ahead. So just a little background on Do It and myself. Uh, we're an IT service agency within the city uh, of New York. Our mandate is to provide IT services to both the public and other city agencies. I manage the mapping group, and I guess by default, I am uh, you know, overseeing GIS for the city of New York. Um, we manage the city's repository, uh, and we distribute uh, nearly all of it. Um, and I mentioned, and uh, personally, I manage the group, um, and I also help set the agenda or the uh, vision for this uh, city with respect to geospatial technology. Um, so that affords me a bit of latitude, and it. It's why I'm here today uh, to discuss the work we've done in the import of uh, New York City's data into OSM. So just a little more background on addressing in the city of New York and why uh, I felt that working with the OSM community would be important both to the OSM community but also to the city of New York. It's a bit chaotic in the city with respect to addressing. I like to think of it in terms of designing from the outside in. It's like sort of, uh, uh, it's, you define the exceptions and then you de de define the, the normal cases. But within New York City, there is no central authority for addressing. There's five boroughs that compose the city of New York. Each one follows their own standards. So there's no standardization across the boroughs. You have the creation of ceremonial street names. And then you have issues of compliance out in the field. So people who follow Feng Shui don't like this number. People who don't want to get a notice of violations from the Department of Sanitation just remove their shield or they change the numbers willy-nilly. And then with respect to changes, it's one city, but there's many agencies with often competing interests and mandates. And so the workflow is less than ideal. It's a bit ad hoc. So that really sets the stage for um, how working with OSM could improve data within the city of New York. Um, this is one of my favorite examples, and I always kind of think about, you know, the 311 or the 911 operator that gets a call and says, there's a white van that's blocking my car. Okay, what is the location of that? It's, it's on a new street. Okay, so what's the name of that street? A new street. Okay, yeah, if you don't get the click immediately, then you'll probably get another follow-up question. But um, this was, in fact, a real sign. This is not Photoshop. Um, so, as I mentioned, there are anomalies throughout the city of New York. You like to have even numbers on one side, odd on the other. We don't necessarily follow that. Numbers are out of sequence, so 911 dispatchers is calling, you know. So, and then you have the vanity addresses, right? You have the cases where these plazas become popular and everybody wants the number. Or you have the case where Park Avenue is a really nice name and I think I can get more money for my apartments if I get that Park Avenue address so I can pay the borough president a certain amount of money and get that Park Avenue address even though I'm west, on West 57th Street. So and then you have subdivisions that have their own unique addressing. Um, this is one prime example, Edgewater Park in the Bronx where often public safety responders are met at the gate by the community to help show them where these locations are. So I'm always amazed that the post office is able to deliver, deliver letters in here. But um, these are just some examples. Um, this is Penn Plaza in the city. It started off with one and two Penn Plaza, but everybody thought that's a good idea, so they're, spring, they're sprouting up all over the city. They'll probably be winding up in Brooklyn next year. Um, so all of this led us um, me specifically to start thinking about all right, crowdsourcing. Um, I kind of identified what the issues are, problematic workflows, uh, don't want to whine, but we have limited staffing, we don't have people that can go out into the field, so everything we do is at a computer terminal with, you know, site plans, this, that, or the other thing. And then the discrepancies between official records and what exists out there in reality. You know, and the OSM is an engaged community. It's another set of eyes, or a thousand set of eyes out there. And then really what, this all, what made this all 
uh, possible was New York City's passing of Local Law 11, which really put all of the city's data into the public domain. Um, it's not all out there. We had a plan that we, we were required to put together a plan, and the plan is by 2018, all of the city's data needs to be out there in the public domain. So um, we don't have that same problem, Alex. We don't have to discuss licensing, and I don't have to sign license agreements anymore. And you know, now my personal views are now aligned more with the city's views. So it makes my life a lot easier. So. We had tried, we have an application out there, we tried to get feedback, but we didn't have an engaged community. So you get dribs and drabs of information, but you don't sort of get the, the feedback that you really want, and that's really important to help keep that data current and accurate. Um, this is a slide I like to add that just sort of demonstrates what the economic impact is for sharing or making data publicly available. Um, McKinsey estimated the value to be three trillion per year. That's worldwide. So, why did we engage the OS community, OSM community for putting some of the New York City data out there? Um, as I had indicated, it's um, really opening it up to not only people who know mapping GIS, but to a wider audience. Uh, improve the data, and then engage the community in the update process. So this is really the overall objectives for this effort. So, you know, if you're someone who knows GIS mapping, you can go to the Socrates site, our open data portal. You can download it. You can map it in QGIS or whatever you want. You can create your own tiles. That's more maybe sophisticated. Requires a certain amount of expertise. Or you can just connect to OSM through many of the products that are out there, desk, web, desktop, web, mobile, open or closed systems. So to us, it opened up our data to a wider audience. And that's really an important concept for us, you know? Someone's navigating the city streets and using an AVL system with a map. It's important to the city that that's the most current data, not just that we in the city have the most current data. So what did the uh, data import involved? So we had put the data out there, and no one had really downloaded it and, and reached out to me So about importing it into OSM. So I had reached out to. Mapbox, specifically Alex Barth, I had worked with him on uh, efforts around Hurricane Sandy, hatched an idea, and we went with it. Um, so New York City's involvement, mine specifically, was to provide the data and answer some questions, provide some technical expertise along the way. Um, I didn't get involved in any of the import efforts. Um, the, the data that was provided were the building footprints and the address points, each roughly a million. Um, and if you want the data for yourself, it's also available on the, on the, the Open Data Portal site. Um, so there was a kickoff in New York City. Um, I think there was about 20 some odd participants. Um, and that really began the effort. Um, and then, so current as of today, uh, it is uh, roughly 70% complete. There were some formatting issues. Um, the data was essentially split by election districts, so there's a roughly 10,000 election districts within the city of New York, each one reviewed before being brought into OSM. And then to the city's benefit, there's a change script running that notifies us of any changes, right? So during the import process, there's a lot of noise. We're being notified of data we already have being import in, imported in, but when the import's complete, and the OSM community starts making edits, we'll be notified of those edits. And to us, it's another step along the way or another process to be notified of changes. We are notified internally, but thing that, things do fall between the cracks. So it really, it's just another way of catching things that might have been missed. Oh, excuse me. And this is an example of that change notification email. Um, so. It specifies what change was made. There's a graphic on where that change was, and you can click on it and get more details. So my staff is not actually taking the data out of OSM, and I wasn't really aware of the licensing issues. We may have done it anyway, but we're not doing it. We're using this just as a way of being alerted of changes. Um, and then you can click. You can get details on what change was made. Um, and here is an animation showing the seeding of New York City with uh, uh, the seeding of OSM with the New York City data. Um, so you can ignore the stuff on the other side of the Hudson River. Um, so one more time. 
So it was uh, quite a large data set, highly accurate. Um, it's been battle tested, if you will. It's used by the 311 system. It's used by 911 dispatchers. Um, it's evolved over time. So it is a highly accurate and complete data set, but we're always looking to improve it. So lessons learned from the effort, and these are lessons I've learned, not specifically the community in general. These are my observations. Um, you have to really involve the community. Without that involvement, um, you know, the, the fruit will die on the vine or you'll have a lot of resistance. Um, this may not be the, something that everyone agrees to, but I feel like, you know, accuracy should always prevail. I, I, I understand the sensitivities of overwriting user-provided content, but for us, really, what's most accurate and current really should prevail. Um, and for us, looking internally, metadata can always be improved. The addressing within the city is problematic. The data model is even more confusing. Um, and you know, just having the community respond to a lot of the data and asking a lot of questions really illustrated some of the um, strangeness with the data model. Um, and constructive feedback is always great. Um, it's really helpful to us. Uh, and you know, as I said, addressing in the city is a challenge, and it will be for the foreseeable future but hopefully made easier with the OSM community. Uh, some future possibilities. There's certainly a lot of other data that the city possesses and there could be additional data imports. Um, like to work on a bi-directional notification. Uh, Alex brought up the, the <coughs> concern about us bringing data back in, but also since the import, there's been 40,000 updates made to the data. Uh, is that five minutes? Okay. Um, so we would like to be able to provide that data back to the OSM community and keep both as close to being in sync as possible. Um, and I thought about you know problem areas like we've had after Hurricane Sandy and the Rockaways when they were doing a lot of the inspections, there were a lot of problem addresses there. So there are specific geographic areas that are still very difficult and challenging and maybe having focused events that, that address specific geographic communities to help resolve those. And then, you know, potentially New York City could be looked at as a model for others. Um, and then sort of my personal observations. You know, clearly the, the OSM community approaches bulk Im imports cautiously, and I think that's appropriate. Um, but really, with the whole open data movement, you're going to see a lot more governments releasing their data to the public domain. So I think the, the concept of bulk imports, you know, when OSM started in, in early 2000, it was a very different landscape, and I think that landscape has consider, considerably changed, and I think maybe the OSM approach needs to change uh, along with the sea change that's happening within governments um, to maybe a more symbiotic relationships where there's more partnerships, um, collaboration between governments and the OSM community. Um, so. If, there's any, if you'd like any more information, you can follow these links. It shows the initial proposal, uh, the meetup, and there's a uh, link to all the technical details on, on GitHub and, and the threads of conversation that have uh, evolved around this import. And then if you want to contact me directly, that's my work email, that's my Twitter handle. I'm always available. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned accuracy, and I was, I was also curious about precision. Um, oh, you're going to get technical on me. Well, I was the, uh, <laughs> you have that was a joke. Do <laughs> you have a precise uh, location for the address? As a, as, like, so they represent approximately the entrance right. of a building, right? So. Yeah, so the accuracy and precision of sort of our aerial photography, I can give you the numbers on that one. Um, for the address points, it's approximating the entrance of a building. And for, for many buildings, there's multiple entrances. If there's a signed uh, house number, the point will only be where that house number is. If there are multiple addresses on a building, it'll have all those addresses. So, yes, Serge. So what advice do you have for uh, cities that don't have a city advocate pushing for open data laws and a mayor that's data driven? Uh, they should play follow the leader. Um, so what, I, what advice would I have to other cities that don't have a sort of visionary at the helm or uh, a public advocate or for in, in our case it was the city council 
who really proposed the open data legislation and got it passed. Well, it was multiple council members, really, but Council Brewer is yeah, Gail Brewer is always the leader on that one. But you know, we, we'd actually testified in the city council way before that law passed. So, and and that didn't just open up everything. Really, we had already provided a lot of our data. It just um, most of the GIS data had already been provided, but it just provided the opportunity to share even more. But the advice would be to you know to look at the numbers in terms of economic impact. I'm, I'm on a committee at New York State level, and there's a lot of communities that still want to charge you know $500 for a parcel data set. And I always respond to them, it's probably costing you 2000 to charge that $500, right, in the cost for your employees. So, you know, might as well just release the data and, you know, hopefully you'll have some economic benefit to it. Maybe even someone will download the data and solve some of the problems that you haven't been able to solve in your own communities. So, um, any other questions? Yes? What do you think are some of the more promising ideas for the open tree map community to contribute back and close that virtuous circle? So I think of projects like, is it 560 acres? I can't remember the exact number we're just looking at. 596. 596. Looking at city owned land that's not being put together use that could be used for community gardening purposes. And I think they found out, correct me if I'm wrong, that the city didn't have like a single database of that. That data set. That's something actually that the community which might be. Sure, sure. I mean, there was a lot of issues underway. I was speaking more specific to the update of geospatial data and not necessarily um, insight into city operations or how it plans things. But yeah, there's certainly opportunities for that. I know that certain agencies are probably better at things than others are. I know DOT is always out there engaging the community before they're putting bike lanes down or they're you know, greatly impacting a neighborhood. But yeah, I mean, um, vacant lots is probably less of an issue than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, so there's probably less available space, but there are some sites out there. Um, there's a, one very poorly named application by the name of Speed, Searchable Property E Environmental Database, or something along those lines where, you know, it's intended to collaborate with a community. Um, not the greatest application, not very well marketed, but yeah, there's, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Um, usually the, the, the gateway into the city is, is probably community board meetings, your, your local city council representative, if you're not getting traction within the city agency that you need to get traction with. Yes? I can't speak specifically for the state of New York. I don't work for the state of New York, but I would say it's highly unlikely with all the local governments, tribal governments, county governments. It's, it's extremely unlikely. Um, I, they're working on an address point database right now to, to support their 911 system. And I've recommended to them that they release that data. So uh, we'll see, but I, I, I doubt it. it. Certainly doesn't exist within the city of New York. You know, and these, these have evolved over time. I mean, you know, it was two cities. Brooklyn was a separate city. You know, the borough, borough presidents largely are ceremonial. The last remaining function that they have is assignment of address. And most people think it's a very, you know, benign role, but it has, you know, real large implications. Um, I'd advocate for removing that from them, but, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, everyone.